ask Bob Feingold to introduce our very special guest uh, this morning, uh, Professor Elon Trowen. Thank you, Rabbi. Elon Trowen and I are the same age. When we were both 10 or 11 years old, growing up in different parts of the city of Boston, we of course didn't know each other, but we had something in common, which of course we had no idea what it was until a few years later when we found ourselves classmates at the prose door of Hebrew College. That thing that we had in common was that we both liked Hebrew school. <laughs> so all during our years in public high school, in the afternoon and early evening, we attended the Hebrew Teachers College in Brookline, Massachusetts. In addition to the morning and early afternoon classes at public high school, we spent 20 hours a week at the Hebrew College. That was four to seven every day, and nine to one on Sundays. We went on to our college careers with no special relationship. He went to Brandeis, then he pursued a doctorate at the University of Chicago with a PhD in Israel Studies. He and his wife Carol in 1975 made Aliyah to Israel and settled in Beersheba where he became a professor of Israel studies at the Ben-Gurion University, where he occupied a very dignified chair at the university. In the early 2000s, he came back to Boston, appointed as the first chair in Schusterman-funded studies at Brandeis University, where he occupied another chair, and he is emeritus now in both of those and he taught Israel studies for 10 years, among other things at Brandeis University. He went on to become an authority in his field, speaking around the world, publishing, and he has a new book coming out, and he is traveling now on behalf of Ben Gurion University in the United States to talk about his experiences of October 7th, and his personal and family's commitment to the dream of Zionism. I've been fortunate to have him as my close friend through all of these years, and that the university saw fit to have him start this tour here in Florida so that he could spend this Shabbat with me and Danette personally. My great honor and pleasure to prevent my friend, to present my friend, Elon Trowin. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Um, <clears throat> it's the only apology I'll make for anything that I'm going to say. Um, it's good to be here with Bob and Annette and in a congregation Bob has told me about and I know that he's devoted to. And it's also good to discover Mike Shore, whose uh, wife, his late wife, Bernice Batya Nisi, was also a classmate of ours in Hebrew College. And she was a very pretty young, young lady that many of us admired. Some of us, um, would hope, what was the word, Litzachik? But it was, it was to be Mike's good fortune to, to enjoy that and not the rest of us. Actually, I have spoken all over the world from uh, Beijing to, uh, uh, to India, to Australia, s um, South Africa, across Europe from Krakow and, and Prague to, to Oxford and Cambridge and across this country. Um, this is the most difficult speaking tour that I have had and I hope will ever have. Um, I've never gone abroad when my country is at war. 
And there's something real about being here in Southern Florida with these very clean, sun-soaked streets, lovely homes, some more magnificent than the others, and to, to leave my own Beersheba. We live 22 or 24 miles from the Gaza border, which is around 40 sec 45 seconds by missile fire from Gaza Strip. In our house, we have something that none of you have, no matter how wealthy or well-equipped your domicile might be. We have a bomb shelter. It is 16 inches of reinforced concrete with a metal door, and it has special apparatus for air filtration, and we have been using it at least since Saddam Hussein from Iraq pointed his missiles towards Demona and targeted uh, much of Israel, including us, but most especially from our neighbors across the border in Gaza. And uh, it's difficult because if I would wake up in Israel this morning, I would have woken up to a ping, ping, ping. That's the application that we all have on our phones. And it alerts us that a missile has been fired either from the Lebanon or from Gaza, someplace in Israel. Not as bad as on October 7th. That was beyond belief and a terrible experience that I will not dwell upon here. Uh, out of the sense of Onik Shabbat, although that too was a Shabbat, that we had gone to Jerusalem to celebrate Simchat Torah and to have the largest Onik that we could possibly have, and it turned out to be one of the greatest tragedies of our family, but not only of our family, but of our people's contemporary history. So uh, it's, it's hard to do that, but it's hard to do not only because of from where I'm coming, but from where I'm going. On Tuesday, I'll be addressing the Honors College at the University of Houston. I've already been notified that there will be at least five Texas troopers waiting at the, in the audience to make sure that the audience is quiet because they anticipate that an organization has already um, announced that an Israeli is coming and that therefore they are imperiled and to imperil. They are impressed upon their obligation to upset, um, create measure of chaos and to espouse their particular truth of the particular moment. So where I come from and where I'm going to is marked by the kind of um, disquiet that disrupts and is deeply unsettling. You know, 76 years into Israeli history, we thought we were in a different place. Like many of you, and uh, I'm a month old, a few less than a month older than, than Bob, but I imagine the age difference between many of you and ourselves is not so great. We grew up in a special time. It was post-Holocaust. America was booming. It was the land of freedom. At universities, one could learn things like Western civilization and Jews were part of it. And you could learn about the Judeo-Christian tradition. Today, you can't do that at the good universities because it privileges unfairly the white oppressors and that therefore a whole canon of books that I grew up on and I would bet that most of you grew up on are no longer within the cultural apprehension of this generation of those who go to college. Uh, the narrative of change. That the narrative would have changed so remarkably that at one time when I grew up, the notion would be never again. Who of us will say never again today? Not I, I don't believe it. It can happen again. Amalek is out there and uh, we vanquished, vanquished him once. We can vanquish him again soon in uh, not only in Tehran, but all over the world, we will hang Haman, um, but they exist. After all, why was my daughter, who just turned 50, why was she murdered 
in her so-called safe room on Kibbutz Cholit on the border of Gaza. The reason is written into the Hamas Charter. The Hamas Charter says explicitly that we are impelled to act in, in accordance with the strictures of our faith that tells us that we shall, because we may, not only may, but we shall kill Jews. They may be hide behind the trees, and if you know the Quran, and the Quran will tell us that the trees themselves will reveal the location of the Jews, and then we may slay them. The whole notion that a major culture in the world in which we live justifies, imperils, impels a society to kill Jews was not something that I imagined was possible growing up in post-Holocaust Boston, getting my graduate training here in the United States. I've been at Princeton and at Harvard and even at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, that was just not the spirit that would be not possible to be said. But yet people at those universities give counsel and comfort to those who believe that the divine has given them the right to murder Jews. How do you explain the people who were trained in, in universal rights and human rights and all that we have held to be true within Western and the Judeo-Christian tradition can justify from the river to the sea the land shall be free, which really means the destruction of Jews. Um, that's the great question. It's a challenge. We're not finished. Never again, don't you ever again believe that never again is not possible. One of the more interesting books, and I won't make this a lecture, is by David Nuremberg. It's called The Anti-Judaic Idea. And it's an explanation how anti-Semitism has been part of civilization since the Egyptians to our own day. And the remarkable part is that anti-Semitism can exist where there are no Jews. We are also an idea, not a reality. Thus, England, Shakespeare's England, there weren't many Shylocks, but Shakespeare could write about Shylock. After the 1492 in the Iberian Peninsula, Jews were an intellectual presence, if not an actual one. In New England, there were no Jews, and the few that were there didn't have rights and were forced to convert. They were there as Jews. Jews are an idea. We are a civilization. We are a culture. We're something that other cultures has seen negative and has seen useful as a mirror of something that they um, view in a negative way. And sometimes that negation has turned to the kind of violence we see. Now the remarkable thing, and I'll just, I, I won't go on about this because it is Onik Shabbat. My uh, daughter and my son-in-law, who's a child of, <coughs> immigrants from Romania who came to Israel after the Second World War um, and whose father worked as an electrician in the atomic reactor in Demona and whose mother was a well-known musician and accordionist um, who brought music to wherever she was and brought up a beautiful son, Shlomi, uh, who was an extraordinarily talented musician and they met at the equivalent of the Juilliard School for Jazz in Tel Aviv. Um, and they fell in love and they brought music to wherever they were, whether it was in the kibbutz cholit, whether it was in our family, whether it was in choirs from the local colleges, universities, high schools and all the rest. You can hear them in YouTube. They sang together. Uh, the words of their songs are, are inscribed on their tombstones. Um, that both of them who were dedicated to life 
and, and living uh, decided that they wanted to live in the Negev, <coughs> not go to Tel Aviv, not go to the big city. Excuse me. This alas is plain water. Go to the big city. Um, but they would join a community of other people with similar values and go to a kibbutz. For what they wanted was nothing more than to participate in the rebuilding of the Jewish national home. I know there's someone else here who has family in the Negev, and the Negev was really underpopulated. There was no one city, there's no industry, there were no orchards. The part of the Negev that they lived in, should you go there even today, even after the neglect of the past few months, is a veritable utopia. It's a garden. Miles of orchards, of, of citrus trees, and also of things that don't exist in the Bible, like kiwis and avocados, and miles of hothouses, and small communities of people who have come to build their lives in quiet, and with values and mutual caring. And uh, overnight, that became a place of terror. I wrote a piece that was picked up by CNN and got a million viewers almost immediately, and another piece that got 750,000. It was about the word pogrom. Now, our commentators don't really know how to talk about what happened on October 7th. What happened on October 7th was a pogrom. And you should all know what that word means and what its origin is. Pogrom is Russian for the noise in the midst of a storm. And in 1881, something called, Mike certainly knows, and I know Bob knows, Sufota Negev. These were the storms that raged in a part of Eastern Europe in which Jews were massacred. Those were the, the events that imperiled, impelled Eastern European Jewry to go west. They may have stopped in Switzerland or in France or in England or crossed the oceans to North America, South America, Australia, wherever they went in the world. But the flight of modern Jewry began in 1881 because of pogroms. Pogrom entered from the Russian into the Yiddish immediately, for it was Jews who took the Russian and made it into a Yiddish word. Within no time at all, from the Yiddish, it became a word in every European language. And a pogrom is not a military attack against innocents. A pogrom has a very special meaning. A pogrom is an attack against innocent people because they are different, particularly if they are Jews. So a pogrom is an attack against innocent Jews. I have to tell you, my daughter-in-law, my son-in-law, and the other people who lived on that envelope of the Gaza border, live there out of a sense of commitment of developing Israel, and also out of a sense of neighborliness. My daughter and son-in-law were founders of a multilingual school where their kids learned Arabic and Hebrew, as well as English, where they learned about the festivals, the customs, the beliefs, of other people with whom they assumed that they would be living for the rest of their lives. My son-in-law was one of the founders of that school and used to teach music there, naturally. In short, they came with the expectation that it would be possible for mutual accommodation and mutual understanding, and never did they imagine the kind of fate that awaited them on October 7th um, on that terrible morning when the ping, 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 ping began. And they were killed in their own so-called safe room with my daughter covering the body of her son, my grandson, and uh, saved his life. And, uh, and all the terrible things that happened thereafter and continue to go on. 
and how difficult it, it is for us now to explain why that is an event, an occasion, a circumstance that we can't allow to continue and to happen again. What the right course is, I'm not going to tell you. We just read in this parasha, and I'm not a rabbi, but how interesting it is that uh, the people at one time or another followed the, their instincts with lack of patience and chose a leader, a great leader. They chose Aaron, and it was no less than Aaron who helped them create the golden calf. Had they waited a little bit longer and exercised a bit more patience and wisdom, Moses would have come down and have told the people what it is that were the, should be their true values and their true beliefs. So the test for those of us who live in Israel, and even for those of us who live abroad, is to have patience, savlanut, and uh, fortitude, and try to discern between the false and the true as we determine what kind of course of action this moment requires. I will not share with you what mine is. That would be too political. But I would tell you that the choice is not an easy one. The choice is a very difficult one. And I wish all of us good strength and that the prayers that we have just uttered for the peace and the safety of the state of Israel, for the wisdom of those who govern this country, and for the hopes for all humankind that they will be fulfilled. Thank you. Thank Professor 